Hmm? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I yes, yes. I'm just not sure which microphone we're on. Uh, if, that's a good question. People on Zoom, can you hear us? On Zoom, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so the yeah, I'm not sure if it's working. You should look up. Okay. Okay, so I think we're set. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I can find the damn. Oh, here we go. Move it to the top right. Okay. Oops. Okay. 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 So, I want to welcome everybody to uh, the, the uh, 2022 uh, Neugebauer Lecture, which is uh, a, a talk that's uh, been, uh, uh, been in on, is in honor of uh, Gary Neugebauer, who is the, uh, the creator of infrared astronomy at Caltech. And we're particularly honored today to have uh, as our speaker, Eric Becklin. Eric was uh, Gary's second student and uh, joined the infrared group in uh, 1964. 1964. June of 64. Okay, a long time ago, Eric. Yeah. Uh, so uh, normally I spend a couple of minutes explaining who Gary Neugebauer was, for those of you who, who uh, never heard of him before. But uh, since Eric was his second student and was associated with him for longer than I was, uh, I will let him do that explaining as part of his talk. Uh, so I will just tell you what Eric has done. Uh, Eric uh, got his PhD from Caltech in 1968. And after spending a, a, a jolly year in Harvard, came back to Caltech uh, and uh, as a senior research fellow, and then left uh, Caltech in 1977 to go to the University of Hawaii to become the chief scientist and then the first director of the infrared telescope facility facility, the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility. So he, he oversaw the construction of the telescope and then the beginning of the science program. In uh, 1989, Eric moved to uh, uh, UCLA as a professor. And in 1996, because he didn't have enough to do as, at UCLA, he also became the chief scientist for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, uh, fondly known as SOFIA. Uh, I forgot when Eric became emeritus at UCLA, but he's continued his association both with UCLA and uh, with Sophia. And today he's going to tell us about 55 years of discovery in the Galactic Center in the infrared with Gary Neugebauer and many others. Thank you, Tom. Can you hear me on Zoom? Yes, we can hear you, Eric. Thank you, Hans. <laughs> okay, uh, glad to be here today and thank you uh, for inviting me and this honor of uh, uh, giving the uh, Nuggebauer lecture. And uh, I think I'll just go to the next slide. Um, how do I advance it? something else there. Yeah. Okay, just try that. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna talk just a bit about Gary Nuggebauer and as these are just some personal thoughts, I, but I was his second uh, graduate student and, uh, um, and uh, it, uh, it was just great working with him. It, uh, it was really, uh, I can't say, enough positive things about uh, being a student of Gary Nuggebauer's. Um, so these are some of the things that he uh, took seriously. And one is to take, make, get the data taken and uh, reduce correctly and understand if it's good or not. And uh, worry about that. Write up the results and publish the paper. Don't worry about the interpretation because it'll change in five years. 
uh, work hard. Uh, we are not as smart as Bob Layton. Now, Bob Layton was uh, Gary's cohort in starting up the infrared lab here at, uh, at, um, uh, at Caltech. But um, Bob Layton also had his own group uh, in solar physics, and he discovered just a few years earlier with his students solar oscillations, five minute oscillations. So he, in his own right, and of course, he's built telescopes uh, now in the uh, submillimeter that are around the world. Uh, so don't worry, we're not as smart as Bob. So we need to work hard, twice as hard. That's the quote that I remember. Be honest, both personally and intellectually. And Gary was honest intellectually and just personally, as any other person that I ever know. And he also took some time to enjoy life. Now, how do I get, now oh, there it is. Okay, so this is my outline. Uh, start with the uh, early days at Caltech in the 1960s. I started in the summer of 1964 and I went right into the lab and started working on a photometer that somebody else had already built but had not never got finished it. Um, and then I'll also talk about the two micron sky serine and discovering IR radiation from the galactic center and some other early results. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about the Galactic Center with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. That's work I did with uh, Mike Werner and Ian Gatley. Uh, and uh, also then moved to Hawaii. And I'm gonna talk about some Galactic Center work I did with Chris Selgren, who was a student of uh, yours, Mike, right? Yeah, and, uh, but he was part of the infrared lab here and uh, Don Hall. Then uh, uh, I came to UCLA and uh, I'll talk about uh, all of that, working with large arrays and adaptive optics and uh, getting to know Andrea Gaz and his uh, orbits, a massive black hole, and then finish up with some work that I've done more recently with Sophia on the Galactic Center. And I have a short summary at the end. So the early days of infrared astronomy, as a young graduate student, I was lucky enough to work with uh, Gary and Bob, Gary Nagabauer and Bob Layton, who were carrying out the two micron sky, uh, all sky, well, it's not all sky, Northern Sky Survey at Mount Wilson. It was a 62 epoxy telescope that Bob built, uh, used lead sulfide detectors, and uh, Gary did all the electronics. He did all the management and, uh, um, and we had the shops build the, uh, the enclosures. I've got a picture of the telescope as it was in Smithsonian in the next slide, I believe. Um, when I came in 1964, he gave me the job of finishing the photometer that would work on the optical telescopes at Mount Wilson and Palomar uh, to follow up on the two micron sky survey. Now this was very lucky for me because it, besides working on the survey, which I did, I, I would go up and I'm sure Tom is an undergraduate. He was an undergraduate. By the way, Gary had undergraduates that are just world famous. Uh, uh, Jerry Nelson is one of them. Doug Osheroff who won a Nobel Prize up at Stanford and uh, Ed Groth uh, and Tom Seufer. And I'm probably forgetting a few of the Famous, uh, oh, Dan McCammon, I'll mention him later, uh, uh, really uh, started uh, in Wisconsin X ray astronomy at, and in, uh, well, uh, just. Um, so I could work on the survey, but it allowed me the possibility to go off and make additional observations. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm not going to talk. So, uh, when I uh, first started working, Bob Layton would talk about the Galactic Center and uh, that we ought to be able to see it with the two microns survey. So and we started getting data in 2000, uh, 1964, 65. He asked Gary to go get the coordinates uh, from the radio astronomers at Caltech and Alan Moffat. Uh, and there you see the... Uh, 
the two micron sky survey, that's a primary mirror. It's an epoxy spun uh, mirror. Didn't have a good image. It was about uh, four arc minutes, uh, but uh, the detectors were large also because it was a, a survey and uh, it, it, it did fine. Um, and, the, and then the detector was up here in the top, uh, cryostat, and it had the lead sulfide detectors. Um, there uh, must have been some confusion in the equinox, that's what I always thought. Uh, the, the assumption on our group was that we did not see anything at the position of SAD-J, uh, and uh, just to show that, and I was mentioning this to Tom, Evan Hughes, the first graduate student, built a 10 micron system because Bob and Gary said, well, maybe there's too much extinction and we're not uh, seen to the galactic center, but we might be able to do it at 10 microns, but it was too faint and that didn't work. So he did something else. Um, uh, just to finish the story though, uh, the, uh, after we discovered, which I'll just, just mention uh, the galactic center and published the paper in 1967, uh, the, uh, we re-examined the two micron sky survey for that thing, and it's clearly there. And in fact, it was lots of other stuff because there's extinction and other sources. And uh, it was, uh, so, and it was noted in the catalog that that's SAG, not star, it's just SAG at that point, just the radio source, uh, SAG East and West. Okay, so discovering the radiation from the galactic center besides Knowing that Bob Layton thought the galactic center was important to find in the IR, I was also getting to know something about observing in astrophysics. I had observed M31 and could estimate the uh, reddening using the uh, new field lens at, uh, and also using the new field lens that Dan McCammon built, because I knew we had to have a pretty big field of view to see it. Uh, uh, we should be able to see the galactic center with the photometer at the uh, Mount Wilson telescopes. Uh, when I did, after I did the calculation, I went to Gary and I told him I'm going up to look for the galactic center. No, don't, uh, don't bother looking. I already tried from the survey and it's not going to be there. And uh, I thought, wow, what's, that's really strange. So I went up anyway. And uh, so the lesson is to ignore your advisor. Pardon? The lesson is to ignore your advisor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just as a side, I told Charlie Towns about this. And after that, he had more respect for me <laughs> than, than I deserved, um, believe me. Uh, but I did go against Gary uh, because I had done the calculation. I knew how much extinction there should be. Now, you know, you never know for sure, but. So the, the radiation was located at the position of maximum brightness of the radio source SAG, which Downs and Maxwell had and uh, on the very first scan on the 24 inch. Now I won't show the first scan because I had some problems setting up the telescope that first night, but I did get a scan uh, as it was setting. Uh, but then uh, this is a later scan. Uh, there was actually, uh, but you can see, uh, it's, uh, this is a drift scan across the sky. This is what's called a strip chart. And for those of you that are never seen one, uh, it's a roll of paper that rolls by and then you have a pen that writes on it. So that's a red ink pen that shows and how high it is, that's the more signal. So as we went by, you can see it went up and up to the top and then back down. Then there's another part where the reference beam goes through, so it went negative, but that's been cut off. But uh, I was pretty excited that night because uh, I knew uh, what it was. That was in August of uh, 2000, uh, 1966. So uh, we put the paper together and in doing that, I made this comparison with M31 uh, that, uh, we knew the, uh, the um, uh, we had the measurements of the M31 from Palomar, 
We were using Palomar the, uh, by this time, and we used the smallest beam we could, which was two arc seconds. So uh, that is the top uh, line there, and it's in parsecs, and the resolution is uh, seven parsecs. And then for the galactic center, I just took the map that I made from those, all of the two micron scans on 24 inch and put together the bottom ones, but I corrected the bottom for interstellar extinction. On the visible, it works out to 25 magnitudes approximately or 10 to the 10th, but at two microns, just because uh, the dust grains are uh, small, like smaller than the, or about the wavelength of light or smaller, uh, the two microns only has uh, an extinction of a factor of 10. So that's a huge gain, but uh, in comparing it, they look physically about the same, different wiggles, of course, but, uh, and it, this is just uh, not even along the right angles or anything, it's just uh, what we got RA on the galactic center and RA probably on M31. Uh, um, but uh, when you correct for the measured extinction, the peak brightness is within a factor of two. I forget which is brighter. I think, no, I won't even guess. I, I could look, I should have looked it up because every time I do this, I wonder. But the, uh, I later showed this uh, scan before we published the paper to Alan Sandage. And when he saw these two scans, he said that Walter Bada would have given his eye teeth to make these measurements as one of the quotes I can never forget because both Alan Sandage is uh, very definite. He was this, well, most of you probably have heard of Alan Sandage, so I don't have to. And uh, uh, Walter Bada has the Bada window and he was uh, an observer at, uh, at uh, I, I never met him. Uh, he had passed away by the time I came here. But uh, he was looking for the uh, galactic center using eye plates on the Palomar. Maybe even later, uh, Gary and I continued working uh, and we got maps of uh, the very central region uh, at, and just to see what was there at two microns and 10 microns. And this was done on the 24 inch and it was with two and a half arc second resolution. And there are some famous uh, sources. This is IRS 7, the brightest star. It's a, a super giant in the galactic center. You can just barely see it at 10 microns, but it's way off scale. We now use it as a, uh, a, 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 a source that allows us to correct for the atmosphere for adaptive optics. These other sources are all uh, giants um, or super giants. Uh, this is one by far the, the brightest, but there are various brightness. And then there's a background, which is giants. And, uh, uh, and it just things you uh, uh, can't hear individually solve. I'll get back to what you get once you start getting higher resolution uh, later. Uh, this is the 10 microns, and this is mainly hot dust. Uh, it, from the, uh, uh, there's radio emission that runs along here. And uh, the only source that isn't uh, that kind is this IRS-3, which is a late type star and uh, has a dust cloud around it like IRC plus 10 to 16. And uh, uh, I don't actually know that much about it. It's not uh, something, I, I meant to look it up, but uh, I didn't. Uh, what people have done on that source. Okay, this is Gary Nagabauer and myself in the center. You can see I had shorter hair then. Uh, and Gary is with the uh, glasses. And then on the right with the long hair is Gareth and Williams. He worked here at Caltech in 1972 and three, 71, 72, maybe 73, he came back for a bit and then came to, went to Hawaii with me. He never got interested in the Galactic Center. He was on a few of the papers I noticed, but uh, um, he uh, 
But this is a photograph that I had. So, uh, and that photometer is not the one that I modified and built to uh, make the measurements. That one is downstairs in Keith's lab. <laughs> okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is the Kuiper Airborne Observatory uh, observations, which I did at Caltech with Mike Werner, and then also going to Hawaii and the Galactic Center work on UKIRT and the IRTF. So with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which was a 0.9 meter IR telescope operating in a C-141, it allowed observations beyond 10 and 20 microns. 20 microns we had a hard time doing here in uh, Palomar, we did some, uh, but we could do 10 microns perfectly fine. But in Hawaii and Chile, we could work at 20 microns as well. But beyond that, uh, it was very difficult. So from 30 to 300 microns, you can kind of get an average of 80% and really do a lot of work. In 1982, that's when we published the paper, uh, a group led by Mike Werner, including Ian Gatley and myself, mapped the central 10 parsecs of the Galactic Center with 30 arc second resolution at uh, 30, 50, and 100 microns. So we knew where to look at that point. And we discovered the circumnuclear ring or disk uh, at, uh, at these three wavelengths. Uh, at 30 microns, it's just one source centered on Sag A star, or Sag A at that time. Uh, and star uh, was known at that point. Uh, and then 50 microns, it started going into elongation with a double lobe. And at 100 microns, the lobes are bigger. And uh, we interpreted this as a ring of dust, probably orbiting. And later, just a few years later, people started measuring the actual orbit of that ring. And, uh, and the, uh, in the paper, I think we thought maybe this was being heated by a uh, Sag A star or some, but in fact, in the end, it was the uh, um, bright uh, stars that were forming down there, uh, like Iris uh, 7 or the pre predecessors to Iris 7. Yeah, Mike. The reason this worked was because we had one aperture and all the light along mm. the bands came from the same aperture. So Thank you. No misunderstanding about where the 30 micron radiation goes into what 100 micron. And that was due to Eric's great physical intuition and realization that he couldn't really point the telescope on the airplane that well. But if we knew the relative positions, you could be pretty sure that the 30 microns is coming from the hot central part of the thing and the uh, longer wave lengths were in the outer periphery. And I attribute that to Eric's great physical intuition. But there was another group that had the same result but didn't realize that the the 50 micron radiation didn't peak at Sagittarius A, and I got the wrong answer. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So in 1977, John Jeffers offered me a position at the University of Hawaii and uh, to head the uh, NASA three meter that was just being built at that time just about to be, uh, well, in two years, it became operational. Um, in the uh, mid eighties, I began to realize measuring the radial velocities of stars uh, in the central few parsecs around Sag A star. Now Sag A star was the radio source that was known, but people were trying to determine, is that really where there's a, something really happening uh, or ma massive, and the best way to see if there's any massive black hole or something like that would be to measure the stars. People had done it in the gas. Uh, Charlie Towns started that, and Reinhard Genzel, and others. Uh, but there was always, and John Lacey, his student, did a lot of work. Uh, they were getting an answer that there was something, but there was always this question, is this uh, due to some other uh, 
effects on the gas rather than uh, the effect of the black hole. So if you measure the stars, you know that they are under the influence of that. And there's not something else that will influence the motion of the, uh, the gas. So uh, I convinced uh, Chris Salgren and Don Hall, and Don was already interested, but once I suggested doing this, measuring the CO band head on the uh, UKIRT at 2.3 microns, uh, we, we actually could uh, solve this problem. We, we uh, actually uh, did it all, more uh, work on the IRTF as well with higher resolution. I just show this to see that this is, uh, it's uh, 45 arc seconds on, to the north um, uh, east and uh, um, 45 arc seconds to the southwest. So along the, uh, the, uh, the, the region that we thought uh, uh, along the plane. This, that's where the, along the galactic plane. And uh, in doing this, we found that there was a mass of about uh, a few times 10 to the six with pretty big, big error bars. But at the time I was pretty excited about this. And, uh, uh, and it, was, uh, it was some very nice work. Okay, so then uh, the next thing that happened is that uh, um, my family wanted to move back to the mainland and uh, I got a job offer from UCLA. There was also a lot happening in the, uh, at, in the detector uh, area as well as uh, the Keck coming on. And so there's more galactic center work to come. So Mike Jura invited Ian McLean and myself to UCLA in the 1980s to start an IR lab, IR lab and get involved in the Keck telescope. Um, a revolution was happening in IR detectors before we used single elements and would scan across the telescope. Now they were getting uh, multi-element arrays and Ian McLean was one of the leaders in promoting that as along with Don Hall and uh, and uh, so uh, Mike uh, invited both of us to come. I also um, knew, had uh, worked uh, with the, uh, um, the Keck Observatory development because uh, uh, Jerry Nelson was uh, uh, coming to all of our meetings out there. So I got to know Jerry. I'd already known Jerry and I knew how smart he was. And I had a feeling he was going to. Uh, so we came and it was actually a, a great success. Ian started the lab and, uh, and we got involved with Keck instrumentation, which uh, is happening to this day. Um, uh, although both Ian and I have now long retired, there's still a group that works on the Keck instrumentation and working with the people here at Caltech and doing that and also now with the TMT. So in 1993, UCLA hired Andrea Guest to work on young double stars. Well, that's what she worked on here with Gary Nuggebauer. And uh, um, when I heard her give that talk at UCLA, I was blown away, both the fact that she was presented it so well and had everything documented so well, but the result also was something that I know um, um, uh, George Herbig at uh, uh, Hawaii at the time was trying to do, uh, and uh, she just uh, just did the amazing work. So we hired her, uh, and we then once she, she was hired, uh, Mark Morris and I uh, convinced her to observe the Galactic Center as well. Now we did use. Tom and Gary's telescope time to do a lot of the testing. And actually the first observation uh, was done with their time, but the scene, which is never bad at Mauna Kea, I've never seen it this bad, but it was a big blob about five to 10 arc seconds in diameter. Fill the whole, uh, oh, by the way, Keith Matthews built us a special uh, uh, 
a conversion so that we can actually do the speckle uh, with the, uh, the NERC 2 camera that Gary and uh, Tom built uh, for Keck and Keith. Well, Keith was, Chris <laughs> can't forget Keith ever. By the way, he still works for us, works with us. And I think he's on. So, okay. so that was uh, one revolution, the one in detectors. The other was occurring in ground based astronomy. I first saw this at Lick when I was observing there with Ben, and Claire Max came with her lasers, and, uh, and they actually could do adaptive optics uh, and uh, actually make uh, the images better. Um, so uh, that was the other revolution. And uh, I just put a picture up here. Of, I had a picture of Claire. I added Peter Bavinovich because he is the one at Tech that really pushed the development of the adaptive optics and the lasers uh, over the years. And he just won the Weber Prize for doing that. Uh, just last week. So it was timely that I added them in, or two weeks ago it was announced. Uh, uh, we, uh, we also knew that uh, this was gonna work best in the uh, one to five micron region because it's longer wavelengths and a slower atmosphere and much easier to correct. People do correct in the visible, but you have to be very fast and your, your cells are very small. I'm not going to get into that. But right now we get near diffraction limited on the Keck meter, uh, 10 meter telescope at 2.2. Well, we get uh, images with about uh, 40 to 50% of the light in a core. And at 3.7 microns, we get almost 80% of the light in the core. Pretty much on a regular basis. Once in a while, things don't work out. But Okay, now this is a comparison I really like. It's uh, how fast things changed from 1986, when this is the first array that was used on the IRTF. It was built for us, it was a 10 by, or a 32 by 32 uh, lead sulfide uh, array. Or maybe it was in diamantumonite, I forget. Doesn't matter, um, probably was in diamantumonite. Uh, but uh, the image quality is very poor, as you can see. And uh, this is at 3.7 microns. I'm actually not, I'm not, sh sh well, depends on details. They've marked Sag A star here. Over here is 2004 that gets it all. This is the same field, exactly the same field. That source there is that one here, that one that one up there, that ridge there is southwest, which is that one there. So, uh, and with this, you can actually see Sag A star most times at 3.7 microns. Um, so that uh, is just an indication of how the technology was really changing. And we've all made use of that. There's no doubt about that. So. This uh, revolution allowed two groups uh, to make independently discover a massive black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Genzel at MPE in Garking and Andrea Gez and her group, and they both have large groups uh, at UCLA. And their teams follow the orbits for uh, 25 years. You all know this story, but I'll say it again anyway. They jointly won the, well, maybe you didn't know this, they jointly won the Crawford Prize in 2012 in astronomy uh, for this work. Uh, but then uh, in 2020, they also won the Nobel Prize in physics uh, for that work and then further work, which I'll discuss in just a second. Uh, and they provide uh, convincing evidence that there's a mass four times 10 to the sixth sun in the center of the Milky Way. And uh, the measurements included both proper motion of stars and radio velocities of stars. So uh, uh, it's the proper motion that really made the difference. And we 
uh, so both, uh, oh, yeah, both teams detected variable radiation at the position of Sag A star. Uh, we both made our own discoveries, but I know uh, Reinhardt was first, that's why I mentioned him first. He had a three meter telescope, very poor images, but he actually saw some stars that seemed to have some motion. After three years, we had signal noise of 50 that there were five stars that were moving clearly across the star. And so uh, uh, he did get it right. And uh, so, but uh, the data that uh, Andrea did and what we did later, we were the first ones to actually see an orbit where you see the acceleration and see things move around. Okay, so the next slide you probably have all seen before. Uh, this is one second per year, and the, the star is Sag A star, the black hole. And uh, when that uh, two stars, IRS 16, this one that's elongated, and this other elliptical uh, move by, they were both uh, going about 3% uh, the speed of light. And uh, it's IRS 16. This one here. Oops. And this one that is the one that uh, gives the most information uh, up till now and probably for a while. Uh, it looks not quite as elliptical as this one uh, IRS-16, and that's because it's actually projected in this, the sky. Um, uh, it's, it's actually pointing, it's, uh, pointing towards us, I believe. Um, and uh, so uh, if the actual ellipse of the orbit is actually uh, much more steep, and it cuts very close to Sag A star. So uh, here is Andrea. So the Keck and BLT orbits are the strongest evidence for a massive black hole. That's Andrea Gez and Mark Morris, who was, uh, we started the Galactic Center Group, which has now grown. This is only about half as big as it is now. And uh, uh, this was a few years ago. So the mass of the black hole is 4 million M sun. Uh, there is a, a few decimal points, but it's actually, it, it's tied into the distance. So uh, the distance is approximately eight parsecs. Uh, so at this point, I'd say this is known to probably 5% or something in terms of the mass of the black hole, although I'm sure the, uh, uh, Genzel and the gravity group would say it's known a lot more. So those two stars were moving 3% of the speed of light, I mentioned that, and they were about 100 AU from the black hole at the time that they zipped around. Um, during the, uh, the, the first passage, we uh, only got some velocity measurements, the first velocity measurements, we were lucky to get those. Uh, and then, uh, the second, we were much more prepared, and as was the, uh, the Genzo group. In fact, they even had an interferometer uh, put together and were working on it uh, on, in that, uh, for that passage. And they, uh, both teams measured the uh, gravitational redshift of SO2 uh, as it moved around at about the uh, five to uh, seven sigma level. Later, Genzel et al. also measured the gravitational precession, which is uh, the gravitational redshift is just going out of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the influence of the, uh, of, the, of, the of the black hole. But the precession is something that it kicks around and uh, is well known by Einstein and other people, in, uh, but not, uh, well, I know it exists, so I'm not going to say any more. But the, using the gravity interferometer uh, um, to its extreme. Um, but however, uh, the extended mass that is uh, uh, 
potentially out there, maybe other black holes or anything that is out of way will actually produce a systematic error. So the same uh, order of magnitude as the precession. Uh, now, the precession is probably correct, but uh, uh, which is more important, determining the mass of, and anyway, uh, we're trying to debate that now, get limits on the mass. Of it. You really want to know how much mass is out there. and Maybe with enough orbits, we can do that. And that's uh, what both teams are hoping to do. Okay. I now want to change the subject, but stay in SAG-J star with the Galactic Center Group and talk about uh, variations of SAG-J star. I mentioned that we did uh, see variations and we saw them about the same time as the, uh, the German group. It was during the uh, first passage in 2002, just when we were getting the adaptive optics working. Uh, well, we were seeing it with the adaptive optics with the uh, laser guide stars. We weren't really seeing it very well before. We, we could, that's, that's um, so, but uh, this is a movie that was taken uh, from data in 2006. This is one second is one hour and it's going through. You can see SO, Two is this bright object here. Sag star is obviously red. This is a two color or three color. Yes, three colors, uh, 1.6, 2.2 and 3.37 microns. And the, uh, the others are other uh, stars here. Um, but you can clearly see it and, uh, and it's uh, red. And it's pretty amazing actually. Now it's not always doing it like this. But uh, can you see that? Is it? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I, uh, I got very interested in whether there's a phase lag. Uh, so we set up uh, two, uh, uh, two experiments, one on one telescope, the other on the other, and one at 1.6 microns, and the other at 3.8 microns. 3.8 is in red. And you do see that uh, time is running along here, that this drop here uh, occurs after the drop at uh, 1.6. Same is true of the, that there. Uh, so there's some evidence that in fact, the red is lagging the 1.6, and that's a small wavelength difference. And uh, I'm, th these results haven't been written up yet. This is one of the, many things that we have uh, that still needs to get written up, but we all have that uh, issue, I'm sure. Okay, but uh, I think the re one area where progress is made, and we continue looking at SAG star, so there is more progress because it keeps varying. Um, when I showed that uh, a variation to Giovanni Fazio, uh, he, uh, suspected we might be able to make similar measurements with Spitzer and some of the team is right here that actually uh, uh, did that. Uh, and uh, I was a little skeptical, uh, but I, I did, I took the map that uh, Eric Tullestrup did for his thesis at three microns, three and a half microns, and just moved the Spitzer around with the, what they said was the, uh, and, and uh, I, I said, yeah, I think this is probably right. They said they actually looked at some real data and they said, so uh, we uh, put in a proposal and uh, for 24 hours uh, and uh, doing, doing it at 4.5 uh, microns. And uh, what we uh, proposed to do was to check if there was a glass, gas cloud, the G2 discovered by the Genzel and uh, Gillison group I think it's for Gillis and the G. Uh, it's the second one past about Sag A star near the time we'd be making uh, these measurements. So we're, so uh, the first uh, 24 hours that we got is shown here. This is, uh, these are variations and they look very much like the ground-based variations similar to the ones that I showed in that 
Um, uh, and uh, this is the reference point. And by the way, the people that really get the credit here is Joe Hora and uh, Gensel, uh, um, Gunther Witzel, who is a uh, postdoc working with us at, uh, at uh, UCLA. He and Leo couldn't believe that I, we, we would propose this, get time, and then actually see variations. They were just absolutely blown away with that. As I was too, although I'd done it, and I think, yeah. But OK, it's, uh, we did many more. And this is just a sample of that. Uh, um, and, and what was interesting here is we got a sample I guess we don't have a pointer. So this is the X-ray, and uh, this is an X-ray source, and then there's an associated uh, infrared source there. This is the infrared down here. You can see it's different than the the previous one, although the scale is probably slightly different. Um, and there's another one here that's not used, but it's associated there, but. Uh, then there's another one down here. This is a double one and a smaller one over here. Um, so there's a coincidence. And uh, this is work that's done by uh, uh, Bryce Hope, uh, uh, partly for her thesis. Uh, and uh, um, and, and, and you can see that the nature of the flares are different, but what we have found, and this, this is just an example of four, but whenever there's an X-ray uh, flare, there is a, a similar uh, flare. I put it in quotes because we also always see variations at, uh, at uh, two and three microns. Uh, their uh, associated rise up uh, in the infrared. So this is just some uh, general statements about the coincidence of the flares. There are about three to four, five, six flares per day in the IR. Maybe once in a while there's only two or one. Uh, I've never seen a, a Spitzer 24-hour uh, uh, where there's none. Now you can get it on the ground where there, if you're four or five hours where there's nothing uh, per day. Uh, and in the x ray, uh, there are 1.3, and they have a lot of data from uh, Chandra and other telescopes. The duration is about one to two hours for the IR, typical. Uh, and I put flares in quotes. And about half to one hour in the X-ray, so that, uh, and whenever there's an X-ray flare, there is an associated IR flare, and there are about fifteen examples. I've just shown the four, uh, but there's a lot of other IR high peaks, and there's they look exactly the same as the ones. So that's a mystery as to why they look so similar to the ones that are in the X-ray. We've not been able to find anything special about them in the IR. Uh, the X-rays tend to be faster risers and fall, uh, fall times in shorter duration. They also have a much larger dynamical range um, from the top to the bottom or zero. In fact, we don't know where zero is, but just going up and down. The IR fl flares are longer duration tend to be centered later than the X-ray flare, just tended, but they are that it's, and they have dim, uh, limited dynamic wording. And the rise and fall times seem to be similar. Uh, uh, there, there's not that the rise is sharp and then you have a long exponential tail, there's none of that. And the reason I bring that up, uh, Gunther has a model, but in that model, he does have that long tail. And, uh, but the data do not show that. So uh, uh, that's just one of the quirks of the. Okay, any questions about uh, 
Sajay Star, or uh, I'm going to go on to Sophia. How am I doing on time, uh, Tom? Five minutes. Three. Okay, I'll have to be quick. All right. The dust ring orbiting, I will be quick. This is Sophia, two and a half meter. You've all seen this before. Uh, I want to talk about the circumnuclear ring around Sag star and the connection to AGN. Uh, this is a uh, two color map that we published a few years ago, Lau et al. He was here as a postdoc. And uh, this white stuff is the ionized gas and associated hot dust uh, that's falling into the black hole, which is right down there, not shown. And then this uh, yellow, is a circumnuclear ring that uh, we discovered on the Kuiper, but now in much more detail. And uh, it's almost a perfect circle, but it's tipped out of the plane, uh, well, out of the plane of the sky by 60 some degrees, but from our line of sight, it's tipped 23 degrees. So we can actually see in. Now, this is pretty thick in the outer region in the molecules. So if this had been lined up with the plane, there is a chance we wouldn't have seen it at two microns. So maybe uh, uh, it wasn't such a bad idea to try 10 microns, but it didn't work. Um, okay, and it's rotating in this direction, which is the rotation of the galaxy, red shifted to the north, blue shifted to the south. And uh, they, uh, it's quite narrow, but this is just the inner edge, uh, the hot dust. And uh, there's also these features along it, which almost seem periodic. And Mark Morris and Wolfgang Duschel and his student actually think they can explain this by outflow from the bright uh, OB and uh, Wolf Raid and other stars that are in the very center uh, near Sag star. Okay, I'll just skip that, that's, okay. Um, the geometry looks a lot like a classical AGN. There's dust and gas surrounding a massive black hole, the donut and the gas three parsecs in diameter. The outflow would be perpendicular to the disk. The ionized gas will also be falling onto the, and, and hot dust will be falling onto the black hole over the, northern arm and eastern arm right now, um, they'll be in the plane as well. There are two differences from a classical AGN. Sag A star AGN is uh, 10 to the minus nine below Eddington. It is just a wimp. Uh, most of it's in the submillimeter. It's about 33, I mean, uh, 3000 uh, solar luminosities. Uh, and it's got variable end continuum. And the X-ray and infrared are even only a fraction of that. It's only the variable and they're uh, probably on the order of uh, just a few solar luminosities on the average. So it's, it's pretty weak. The other uh, difference is that uh, uh, the disk is, looks similar, but it's, uh, the the, the uh, one around Sag A star is much larger and there's no inner gas ring close to the uh, to the um, uh, the black hole in the galactic center which is proposed in AGN like this one for the uh, uh, in the x-ray uh, that ring is uh, just a fraction of a few parsecs of Okay, uh, O1 in the uh, uh, circumnuclear ring is something I'm working on right now. And this is done with great on Sophia. I, because of time, I'm not gonna. The key players are Mark Morris. He's the PI and he's reducing all the data. And now he's also writing up the paper. There's Ralph Gustin, uh, who's written up some of the observations and he did the observations and Denise, uh, uh, at Bonn also uh, uh, did data reduction. I'm just the presenter. I, I do hold a meeting with uh, Mark every week 
and I do a little bit of writing uh, as well, but not as much as Mark is doing. He's a better writer than I am. Uh, writing was never my strength, and unfortunately, uh, can't do anything about that. But luckily, I worked with a lot of good people like Mike Borner, who's an excellent writer, and Gary Nagabar was a good writer, and Gareth Wynn Williams was also. And uh, Andrea Gaz is another really good writer. Um, okay, this is just a justification. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through that. But uh, that's why we did it, and uh, we got the time. And uh, uh, just one thing about the high level physics, we're doing the O1 line mainly because it has a small beam, uh, six arc seconds, but it's also excited in the high density regions. We, uh, there is simultaneous carbon plus, but which is excited at lower densities. Uh, that data we really haven't used and other people are actually writing up a paper on that, uh, um, the group at, uh, uh, Maryland. Okay. Okay, the spectrometer, uh, just the second bullet, uh, C plus mapping is done with a four element array and it's 50 times faster than high fire on Herschel. And the noise, uh, temperature noise is about a thousand. So it's a combination of, uh, of uh, lower noise uh, temperature and uh, the ability to uh, scan fast across an, uh, an object, which uh, you couldn't do with, uh, with Herschel. The old one heterodyne mapping has a seven element of an array and it's almost as sensitive as the C plus, but it has a six arc second beam. And we haven't, uh, uh, so this is the C plus and uh, because of time, I'm not gonna say uh, too much about this, uh, but it's seen, this is total C plus emission. It's seen here in the north and south. It's, oops. How do I get back? There. Uh, north and south and that's, and here, but it's absorbed across the center. So you don't see it uh, in, in the center. Anyway, uh, we find it's just on the inner ring. Uh, there is a thing that looks like the Northern arm. That's the ionized gas that has different velocities. So that is not associated with, uh, with the Northern arm. It's some other feature. There are also some point sources. So, uh, all right, I've just gone through that. So we'll move on. Hot plus imaging polarization of the circumnuclear ring. Uh, this is a hot plus image of the circumnuclear ring uh, just uh, taken uh, a couple of years ago. And that paper is still waiting to be published, Mike. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And anyway, this compare the why I have this. This compares the original map that Mike and I made, uh, and Ian Gatley on the Kuiper, and this is the detail you get uh, with Sophia. And uh, we have polarization, and these. That's actually that previous uh, image at, uh, at uh, the forecast image that I showed uh, that Lau et all did, but now we have put on the vectors uh, that were measured with Hopf. Done with this streamlining, uh, so you don't get the, uh, the idea how uh, accurate it is in terms of, uh, but you can see it's a very beautiful image and there's a lot of physics that has to be explained in this. So uh, hopefully that paper gets out soon. And uh, this is a summary of Sophia. Uh, because of time, I'll just note that we are now publishing papers at the rate of 50 per year, uh, which is way up from, uh, it's, it's growing. 
And uh, we made a lot of measurements. And uh, for the next, uh, it's the only facility at, uh, with community access in the 28 to 30 microns for the next decade. So uh, you probably have heard that uh, NASA wants to close this down, but it will be a shame because this is a true statement. We're the only facility. So a few uh, lessons learned and uh, from the Galactic. I've truly enjoyed all my observations of the Galactic Center and other observations that I've done as well. I enjoyed them all. Uh, work with good people there. These are the lessons. Uh, uh, I haven't always worked with good people, but uh, it sure helps to work with good people. And, uh, 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 science advances follow the new technology. You saw that with the lasers and the uh, arrays and get the data correct. It's the most important. The data are the most important. Finishing a project and a, uh, write up the paper and enjoy the excitement of discovery. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, let's have time for just a couple of questions. Nick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's the infrared. It, it, it's infrared. It's 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 uh, either synchrotron or uh, sync sync uh, self Compton or some. Pardon? Yeah. Well, we were not absolutely sure, but we uh, probably uh, it's synchrotron. Although the this yeah. Uh, it is, it is. So, uh, yeah, uh, the uh, German group have done that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, oh, Jim. I have a historical question. So when you found Santa Star, how did you know the general vicinity of where it was? Well, it was from the radio source and the radio source was known to about an arc minute. And, and how did you know that was near the Galactic Center? Oh, the radio source? Uh, yeah, no, that's actually a really good question that I didn't cover. Um, Jan Ort uh, had done some models of the galaxy and he had pinpointed something near Sag A star. Now, Sat and Sag A, um, about five arc minutes away. And then, in addition, uh, Sag A was the brightest, that's why it's A. So now we don't know why it should be the brightest, and it turns out because of star formation, which you wouldn't expect right in the nucleus, but it's happening. Uh, that's a whole other mystery that's uh, still trying to be untangled. You know, how do stars form in that region, and why are there so many? And it appears to be periodic. Like, uh, they aren't forming right now. They formed about 4 million years ago. So, but that's, that was, that was, it was a combination of the, Dynamics of the galaxy that Jan Orr did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just one further question. You said that you discovered it on the 24 inch. Yes. What is the 24 inch? Mount Wilson, where we could make observations on a more regular basis, which we did. Jim and I made the first measurements of the comet K second in the infrared. 1.6 to 10 microns. And so it was a telescope that belonged to the Jones department, but it was placed at Mount Wilson. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's enough history. Okay. Well, for those of us who are here, let's thank Eric again. And it's wine and cheese out on the patio. So with that, thank you again.